Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Chris Grant from St. Peter Lutheran Church in Warwick, New York. As always, it's good to share another message with you, but if you'd like to join me live, we meet at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings at 70 Little York Road. So we're actually in the third week of our sermon series, Can I Get a Witness?, where we are looking at the gospel readings for each week and what they say about what it means to be God's witness in all these different types of ways. So if you missed either of the first two messages, they are available on the YouTube channel. To start us off, um, some of you may be familiar with M. Night Shyamalan. He's one of the one uh, well-known uh, Hollywood movie directors, M. Night Shyamalan. His movies often use the same plot device, where a major twist comes right near the end that completely upends many of the assumptions that you have made about the story. At the end of the movie, you sometimes want to actually re-watch the movie to figure out how you missed it. With this new revelation, you have a whole new perspective on the shape of the story. Perhaps the most famous example of this is the movie The Sixth Sense. Now, the movie did come out 20, over 20 years ago, so I think I can spoil it um, at, the, at this point. But in this story, a child is haunted by visions of people who have already died. A man, played by Bruce Willis, is with him, trying to help him throughout the movie. And then at the end, the plot twist. During the story, Bruce Willis's character was actually dead the whole time, and he didn't know it. Only the young boy could see him. That truth in that movie forces you to rethink everything that you previously assumed about the movie. You simply cannot think about the plot the same way the next time you watch it. One twist and everything changes. A similar thing can happen with people that you know. You may think that you know someone for a while and then you find out something about them. Maybe it's a good thing or maybe it's a bad thing. And it makes you look at them in a whole new light. And once you learn that truth, you, cons you re reconsider your view of that person's character, or their story, or their personality. Like I said, it could be good or bad. Sometimes one truth, whether it's a twist in a movie, or a truth about somebody that you know, or something else, forces you to reconsider your understanding of reality. Now the Gospel reading for today is Mark 8, verses 27 to 38. And in that reading, it gives us one of those huge revelations. In fact, the text actually provides two huge revelations that reshape the view of the reality of the people who are listening to it. And it gives us with insights on how that's those same two truths must change our perspective as witnesses. As it says in Acts 1.9, you will be my witnesses. Jesus in this text is speaking with his disciples and then he asks them in verse 27, who do people say that I am? The disciples um, respond, they say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some say the prophets. But then Jesus asked them, not what do other people say, but what do you say? He says, but to who do you say that I am? Now, left on their own, they probably would have given similar answers. They probably, maybe it would have added a name or two. But Peter says something that changes everything. Peter answers in verse 29, you are the Christ. And that's the version in Mark. Now, Mark actually leaves out a few other parts of the narrative that happens that are reported in the other Gospels. The other Gospels report that Peter not just said that you are the Christ, but that he says, the Son of God. And that Jesus then responds, saying that that revelation was not something that, that Peter thought of or reasoned to himself, but it was a re revelation from the Father, the God, the Father himself. Now, that's a big deal. That is a major plot twist. The prophet and the healer that the disciples were following around was actually Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the actual Son of God. And then right after that, we see another big revelation in verse 30. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. So in these few verses, the reality of the person and work of Jesus is completely reshaped for the disciples. He is the Son of God, and he must suffer and die and rise again. Spoil, spoiler alert for the disciples. Jesus isn't who you thought he was, and his mission is not what you thought it was. And he's the Son of the Almighty God who came to suffer and die to save the world. This revelation changes everything. It has to. It has to change everything. How can the disciples look at the world the same way or follow Jesus with the same mindset now? They can't. And it's the same for us. As witnesses of, it changes our reality and our worldview. It's reshaped by the revelation of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Think of what this revelation means for who you are. Think about it. Rather than the 
accidental result of a directionless evolutionary process in a meaningless universe that is doomed to cosmic death or the object or the view of yourself as the object of a, a God who wants to judge you, who cannot possibly be pleased with us and how we have lived our lives in the world. Rather than that, the truth is a person, God sent his son to live among us and to be with us because he loved us enough that he suffered and died for us in order to save us from death and meaninglessness and to give us hope. That, that truth reshapes everything about our reality and our worldview. Everything in our lives is transformed by this truth. At least it should be. How can it be? All of the good and especially the bad we experience is nothing compared to God's greater plan for us as his people. But it is not always so easy to live with this mindset, a completely reshaped mindset that focuses on the reality and the revelation of who Jesus is and what he did. For some reason, the big plot twist that reshapes the entire narrative of creation doesn't change how we view our lives in the world. It certainly wasn't that way for the disciples. In fact, Peter, who had just been given this great revelation from God, immediately falters. After Jesus is revealed as the Son of God, and he says that he must suffer and die and, he will and that he will rise again, verse 32 says that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, rebuke is maybe not a word that we use a lot, but it basically means to strongly disapprove and to basically reprimand. He reprimanded Jesus, the Son of God, basically saying, sorry, Jesus, your plan is not acceptable. Jesus responds in verse 33. But turning to the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus turns to the crowd and says, If anyone would come after me, let him de deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's some harsh, directed, pointed words. Jesus is drawing some clear distinctions here about where our priorities are and what we focus on. Think about the distinctions. The things of God versus the things of man. He contrasts the world and the soul. Saving your life versus losing your life. His harsh message for Peter and the pointed message for the crowd expose an inconvenient truth. Sometimes we receive the truth of who Jesus is and what he did, and we don't allow it to change our perspective as his witnesses. Instead, we live life as if that revelation never happened. Rather than having a new perspective on life, a life of eternal hope and a divine mission from God, we keep churning away with the same assumptions we have always lived with, focusing on the things of man and the gains of a sinful world. So what does that look like? What does it look like to not refocus our mind? We're going to look at three areas where we can struggle to allow the revelation of Jesus to reshape our view of reality. Three places, our priorities, our ego, and our mission. Our priorities, our ego, and our mission. So first, our priority. Jesus says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? In other words, where are your priorities, man? All the success and prosperity and power in the world will amount to nothing if you spend eternity separated from the love of God. A few years back in my previous church, we were doing a Bible study on heaven and eternity and the second coming of Jesus. And it, I felt like the Bible study really did give us a broader perspective on, on life. And I remember speaking to a woman after one of the sessions and uh, she said, I really want Jesus to come back and I want to go to heaven, but not yet. I want to see my kids graduate college. I want to see my kids graduate college. The second coming we're talking about. Now, mind you, her kids were elementary aged. Sure, this seems like, to me, a, a bit of twisted priorities. Preferring addi additional years living in a sinful world, struggling, temptation, and everything else, just to get a college degree. See, where are the priorities? Now, that's a lighthearted example. But there's an underlying priority problem with most of us. Even as God's witnesses, we often prioritize worldly success, worldly standards, and worldly concerns. 
our reality and mindset is not reshaped by the revelation of Jesus. How is that? Well, we seek our deepest fulfillment in things like our career or our family or our hobbies. We seek our deepest refuge in the stability of our jobs or the stability of our country or, or something else. We seek our deepest love and acceptance from other people. What happens when our sources of fulfillment are taken away or let us down? What happens when our sources of refuge, like our country, start to shake? What happens when we realize that the people in our lives cannot pro provide us the deep love and acceptance that we don't so desperately want? If our reality is not shaped foundationally by the person and work of Jesus, it can be crushing. We can feel overwhelmed by the weight of life, disappointed, cynical. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? Like Peter, we find ourselves not setting our mind on the things of God, but the things of man. But when we allow God to reshape our reality, we are given a higher view of the story, acknowledging that nothing in the world can give us the fulfillment, refuge, and love we need, but that God is all has that all taken care of, and nothing in this world can take that away. When our priorities in life line up with that reality, things change. That's the priorities. Second thing, ego. Now, the next area we struggle is to allow the, the, the revelation of Jesus to reshape our reality through our ego. See, particularly in our relationship to our view of how God works or should work. See, when things go well, we are so quick to acknowledge that God knows what he's doing, that his plan is good. Oh, God has definitely got a great plan for, for creation. You know why? Because... I, got a, I have a great job, I just got a promotion, I got accepted to the school I wanted to go to, I'm having great grades, my relationships are working out, I'm healthy, my family's healthy, the elections went the way that I wanted them to go, there's peace in the world. It's easy to look to God and say, wow, God, I really understand your plan and I agree with it, you're doing a great job. Now, when things don't go well, it's very easy, very natural even, to question why things are happening, what is God doing? When you lose your job, when your relationships are not going well, when the health diagnosis is not good, when there's natural disasters or war or civil tension in the country. It's so natural to ask, God, why is this happening? See, that's a very natural question. But sometimes our ego comes in and we actually think that we know better than God how he should have acted. God should have done this. God should not have allowed that to happen. If only God had done this, everything would be better in the world. Under, underneath, we might think, consciously or subconsciously, that God is wrong and he needs to be corrected. That it would be better to show God how he should be acting. This is what happened with Peter. After the revelation of Jesus being the Messiah and the Son of God, Jesus tells, this, uh, tells, tells the disciples of God's plan. He would have to suffer and die. I'm sure several of the disciples were thinking, Jesus, why? That doesn't, that doesn't compute. Jesus, why did that have to happen? Natural question for the disciples to ask. But Peter's ego took him to the next step. Rather than asking Jesus why, he decided he knew better. Peter rebukes Jesus. He re reprimanded him and expressed disapproval of his plan. His ego got the better of him and Jesus had to correct him, telling him that his mind was focused on the things of man and not the things of God. God would work through the suffering and death of Jesus for the good of the entire world. Even if Peter couldn't see it, Jesus was working good. And Peter needed to be humble to recognize that God's overall plan is not always in view, but his plan is for the good of the world and his people. And that is a reminder to us that we also are naturally are going to ask that question, why God when things happen? Why? But when we ask that question to not let our egos, t t egos tell God that he is wrong and that we know better, we should go to him for comfort and care, knowing that he is working through both good and bad to accomplish his good plan. Being a witness means having that higher view of reality while humbling yourself to how God may be working through it. So that's ego, and we covered priorities. And the last thing I'll cover is the mission. The last part is about mission. The reality of who Jesus is and what he has done must reshape the reality of our mission, both as individual witnesses and as God's church. See, apart from the person and work of, Je and person and work of Jesus, humanity is lost. 
We, the church, his witnesses, are given the mission to bring the message of Jesus to the world, and it is the only message that saves. In John 14, 16, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is a foundational truth about our mission. Jesus says that we are to be his witnesses and that the only way of salvation is through him, through faith in Jesus and his death and his resurrection. When we lose sight of that mission, when our reality is not shaped, reshaped by the person and work of Jesus, we introduce danger. See, what does that mean? Well, in our reading today, Peter rebukes Jesus for speaking about the plan of death and resurrection. The very act that would save mankind, the act that gave power and life to the mission of the church, he reprimanded Jesus for it. Granted, he didn't know better, but he still, but he still did it. Instead of listening to the words of Jesus, being taught by them, being corrected by them, he thought there must be another way. Instead of having his reality reshaped by the message of the cross and the resurrection, he stuck to his own assumptions. And in that little exchange, there's a message to us about the mission of the church and our role as witnesses. The person and work of Jesus is the only way. It's the only way. There is no other way for this to happen. There's no other way for the church to bring salvation to the, to the world except through the person and work of Jesus. See, we might have our own human assumptions that we bring to the table. Assumptions like, well, if we're good enough, we deserve, we can earn what we want, we deserve it. Or maybe assumptions like, you know, if we are authentic and genuine in our belief system and values, that is more important than picking one belief system in particular. Or it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe in something. See, that's assumptions we, we bring. Maybe we just need to be good enough. See, the truth is, good enough is not good enough. All have sinned and fallen short. The truth is that having the right belief system actually matters a lot. Jesus said that no one comes through the Father except through him. Do we accept that? Or does that make us feel bad? Just like Peter, maybe the words of Jesus make us a little uncomfortable. Perhaps we should just let people do and believe what they want. God will take care of it. At least we tell ourselves that because it'll be easier for us that way. But the truth of Jesus needs to reshape our assumptions about reality. He is God. He came to suffer and die, but to rise again to save the world. And he is the only way. As witnesses, both individually and as a church, it is our mission to bring that message to the world. The only message that saves. Jesus ends the reading today saying that whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes to the glory, when the glory of the Father is revealed with the holy angels. It is a call to his witnesses to be unashamed in sharing the good news. And it might sound harsh. It does. It does sound harsh. But the good news is that Jesus already took on the shame that he describes in the text. He already took on the shame culminating in the cross. See, where we fail, he succeeded. He didn't prioritize the things of man over the things of God. He didn't let his own desires to, to, uh, to be relieved of the suffering and dying on the cross overwhelm him. He didn't allow that. And instead he submitted to the will of the Father. No ego. And he didn't lose sight of his mission to die and rise to save the world. And because he went through the cross, we as God's people don't have to worry that God will be ashamed of us when we stand before him. As his witnesses, the huge plot twist of the cross reshapes reality for us. We are given a higher view that withstands the troubles of this life. Don't get bogged down seeking worldly gains and approval. Because of Jesus, you have the ultimate approval and an eternal gain. As his witnesses, we are called to bring that hope to the world, that everyone would share in the eternal joy of knowing Jesus, the Son of God, who suffered and died to save everyone. Amen. I pray that that truth would just resonate with you this week, to have that higher view, not, not desiring the gains of man, and the things of the world, but the things of God and having that higher view as his witness. Amen.